So. Let's start on time. So welcome, welcome everybody to our tutorial, Optimal Tron Algorithms Meet Top K. We are Nikos, me Wolfgang and Mirk, and we are all from Northeastern University. So what we thought about this online challenge is that yes, please use Q&A for posting any questions you may have, we're trying to answer. And we also have uh, for afterwards a post tutorial Zoom space. We posted this uh, Zoom link in the Slack channel so we can continue afterwards for more detailed questions, cons uh, discussions or open Qs and As. And also if you have any questions beyond this tutorial, please feel free to contact us. So why the title of this talk? Well, we observed that there's two areas um, that have been heavily investigated that share some interesting commonalities and slight differences. So in optimal tron algorithms, we want to return all results over joins. In top K, we just want to return the best results. But common to those is we want to avoid unnecessary computations, either unnecessary large intermediate results or any lower ranked results. So we think now that if these two different topics come together, there's an interesting host of questions that arise and something that we that is can be called ranked enumeration or something we refer to as any K. Because what's the best of both worlds? Right? If you incrementally return first the best result and the next result and the next result until the very end, then we achieve both the goals. We get the first early and we get it un until the end. And the key challenge for this overall topic is how can we most effectively push sorting foot joints? So there are also some differences. There's a couple of keywords between top K optimal tunnel algorithms. In particular, two notable differences is the cost model. In the top K, as we're gonna see, is the cost model is we pay for accesses to databases. In optimal channel algorithms, we usually use the uh, common uh, RAM cost model in memory processing. Here we care about the very small result size. Ideally, the cost should be just number of the top results. Here, well, we want to return all results and all results are transitionally far, far larger than the database itself. So this is here where we think ranked enumeration any K fits. Notice that the new challenge is we want to incrementally return the best from the first, second, third, until the very end. So these three parts form the three parts of our tutorial. In the first part, we very quickly want to um, not summarize because it's a very rich, very, very deep field. We want to highlight some of the challenges and the underlying assumptions that were used in, in top K. So what is the problem of top K selection? So here's the abstraction. We assume we have N objects and they have L numeric weight attributes. What we also assume is that there is some aggregate function over the weights. So for each, of the tuples, we could form an aggregate. Here an example aggregate, a sum. So the sum over three, four, and three is, is 10. And the goal is now, we want to find the top K, K is predetermined, for example, K could be two, um, according to the order, an order over this aggregate ranking functions. Notice that in most papers on uh, top K, this is max, we use for consistency for the tutorial the minimum. So we want to find the minimum weight. We assume we have cost and each of those numbers are something we have to pay. So we want to find the minimum cost. So top K means then a set of K objects here too, set none of the other ones, which are not in the set, have a smaller cost. Okay, so this is the overall assumption we had to achieve. Now, the underlying assumption is that we can't access this table, but actually this, um, uh, these attributes are available in L different tables. Here there are three different tables. And in each of those tables, those tuples are actually sorted by the weight. Notice again, we sort it by increasing order in contrast to the way you normally where we have seen um, the threshold algorithm explained. So the key assumption is here now, the assumption that derives more from information retrieval. We want to minimize the access cost, the access cost to each of those, um, of those tables. So they assumed the idea of the middle of the cost model is we, we want to aggregate the rankings over some other services, for example, on the web. And the only cost we care about is every access cost we have to some of those lists. And there's two types of access. The first one is sequential. We sequentially scan as so a sorted access, uh, called normally in the most of these papers. And the second one is 
uh, random access. So we use some index lookup to fetch a particular tuple. So with this particular, uh, with, these, uh, with these cost assumptions, we could actually intuitively also see this, this problem as a join problem. But the join is very simple because it's a join on, based on one-to-one -one relationships. We join them on the unique, um, on the unique ID. So here could be the join. And then the overall goal is give me half a different tables, which we want to access as minimally as possible. We want to reconstruct the results. Then if algorithm is, let's just get all of it, all of the different, um, all of the, the tuples, sort them in main memory, and then we just keep the top K. And then we have what we don't want to have. We have to pay access for all of it. Um, so the key goal in this field is how can we do this faster than accessing all of the data? Now, another crucial assumption is what kind of aggregate functions are those that need to have a property that's called the monotone property. So here's the mathematical formulation. The idea is that if we, if we keep a certain value in this aggregate and we increase it, any of them, then the aggregate will also increase. In the last part of this tutorial, we're going to see a connection and a kind of generalization that as long as this aggregate function is decomposable, which we know um, from aggregates and databases, distributivity, so the function actually doesn't matter in which order you aggregate these tuples, then this is a special case of something that's called a selective diorite, a particular semi-ring, also called a tropical semi-ring, minimum sum. Selective here means the minimum or of A and B is either A or B. So one of the two inputs will be selected. So important early work on this um, mathematics assumption. There were three papers that proposed this threshold algorithm. The last one um, is, has become the Gödel Prize, become famous for it because they were the ones who actually analyzed the algorithm and defined this very important concept of instance optimality. So this is the algorithm we're gonna look at next. What is the idea of this algorithm? Well, following is we're going to access these objects sequentially. So here we access all of them sequentially and we get the top, the top ranked result. We set the threshold to all the values we have seen here, which is the aggregate over those values. This is six here. And then we use random accesses to compute the aggregate weights of all the objects we have seen. We have seen here one, two, and three, but we've only seen part of the values. So we're missing the remaining values. And for this, we use now random access with possibly different costs. When we have them, now we can build the aggregates and we can now rank it and keep the top in this case too. We could optionally purge the rest, but we could also keep it around. So, and the key criterion is now we repeat this until the aggregate weights of all of the values in the top K a smaller than the threshold, six. So in this case, this is not the case. 10 is still bigger than six. So we continue. We make now another access. Now we have here the sum of those last seen ones are 11. Now we have 10 is smaller than 11, and now we can stop. Now we have the guarantee that we have seen the top two uh, of, of the tuples in this, in this, we don't need to access more. Why is this the case? Well, it turns out this monotonicity is a key, key, uh, key ingredient. Why can we avoid looking at any other of those objects? Well, let, let's see. What could happen? X4, the, the next one here, for example, in R2, the value in each of those individual, for these individual attributes, needs to be bigger or equal to the individual values we have seen last. And now we know from the monotonicity property that therefore the aggregate of anything below we haven't seen needs to be bigger than the threshold, which we said is bigger than all of the objects we have seen. So definitely can stop. So the interesting part of this, yeah, so that's the algorithm. Now, what made this algorithm famous is this very interesting guarantees, rare guarantee can give that's called instance optimal, instant cost, of, <laughs> instant cost optimal algorithm. The key thing is you think of the best of any algorithm, except for some, um, um, some weird cases, any other algorithm on any database cannot give you an asymptotic better bound. So this algorithm 
within a constant factor of the best algorithm in a database. That's something that's very interesting. So what happens if we now think a bit more about joins? The models we have now looked at to join was a very simple join model, one-to-one -one relationship. So we assume we now have the same access cost, but um, to simplify it, we ignore random access time, so just sorted access. Makes the exposition simpler. So what we now have is we have many to many relationships. So we don't have any more IDs on which we join. We can have one to many and uh, many to one. So there's no new identifier and we could have arbitrary fetter join conditions. To make it simple for this, we assume a natural join. So we join A2 and we join A3. And again, we want to find those different values and the aggregate weights and 2K in this case, K equal to one. So let's look at one particular algorithm this, that is interesting and to homage the, uh, one of the first ones that, that uh, achieved instance optimality for this setting. So this algorithm now keeps a priority queue. It does some kind of A star search on the space of the condition product of the different tables to find the top K chunk results. So the idea is we keep a priority queue of partial results. Partial results. So partial results means, in this case, from left to right, we will expand longer and longer partial results. We're gonna see the, the intuition behind this. So in the beginning, we have the partial solution is the empty set. And the lower bound, if you use now here, if you assume that weights can be only positive, the lower bound is, is zero. The next tuple we look at is the first tuple in R1. So, and then we keep, we pop always the partial result with the smallest lower bound. Again, keep in mind, we're looking here at the weights, we want to find the smallest one. And then we access the list to extend it. Okay, but let's look at this. So the first result is the empty list. We want to extend it, we extend it in the first table. We look at the first tuple, we learn the weights, and we could now extend this to the next one in R1 or in R2. So we now push two new um, partial solutions back in the priority queue. One that says we keep one, and the other thing is, let's look at the next one, two in, in this case. The next one on which we have here this orange uh, pointer. We have learned now the weight of these tuple. So now for these two, we know that the lower bound is one. So we also know there can't be anything that has, there can't be any trend result that has a lower uh, a lower weight than one. So we pick one of the two, the first ones, and we expand it. Here we said we need to expand in the second one. We expand this. We learn now that A2 is different. So there's no join. It's an invalid join condition. That's the reason why this algorithm doesn't care about whether it's equity join, natural join, any arbitrary join condition. As soon as we learn, we see if the, if the condition actually holds. And therefore we discard this partial solution. So we don't push two back, we just push one back. One is the one if one would join now with the next one in the second table. So number two, we repeat this. The next one is here is one. We extend this by looking at this uh, particular value. We push two back, one longer, one deeper. And we repeat this. Yeah? So I show you now here the animation. We always keep, we always pull the smallest one from the priority queue. We extend it, we push one or zero or two back into the priority queue. And as soon as we have a complete solution and none of the other values has a smaller value, we know we've done it. For the same intuitive reason as we saw in the threshold algorithm. So if you now look and um, if one looks carefully, if we had done a little bit more computation in main memory, we could have actually avoided looking at this last tool. And there's a plethora of different variants of how to achieve uh, uh, sl slightly fewer accesses. In particular, two of those ones is a slight modification. This means we now apply also iterative deepening to J star algorithm. This was also proposed in this original paper from uh, Natsev. Iterative deepening means is 
we just now look and return all of the results that can be um, returned by only limiting, limiting our search to a certain depth in all of the different tables. So here for depth one, depth two, and depth three. And it turns out this small modification is enough to show that this algorithm is instance optimal. Another algorithm that is very similar, just from the beginning, does the same as the threshold algorithm and doesn't even keep around a variety queue and just says we do the same. We just create all of the different results for the first, for the second, and for the level. And both of those algorithms are instance optimal in this particular cost model. And as I mentioned, there's many variants and much follow-up work that use different joint strategies, heuristics, varieties, relations, that try to get even fewer uh, accesses to these different tables. Now, what is interesting? So if you look, for example, in the paper from, from Ilias, comparing their work against JSTAR, then we see the number of access pages is really very similar you know, within a uh, factor and a factor from each other. Because that's the cost model that, um, that this particular abstraction cares about. But if one looks at the time, there's a quite a big difference. Because the time actually also takes into consideration how long does it take us in main memory to compute the joints. And this leads us to the rest of our tutorial, the discussion of cost models. What is actually an appropriate cost model? And there's two different perspectives. Let's look at this particular uh, example here. If you look carefully, you see that actually both J star and rank join, they need to consider a quadratic number of partial results before they can return the top one result. So in the middle there cost model, this is okay. We just want to minimize the access depth. We just have a linear cost because we just um, access linear in the, in, in the number of uh, tuples in the relation, linear I meant here n, so linear in n, not in k. And it's justified by this original motivation, like an information retrieval. We want to, we have latency, we want to minimize the number of accesses to other sources. But if we actually also take into consideration the actual calculations we are doing in main memory, we have a quadratic cost and actually join time matters. So the question is, are number of access is a realistic measure for in-database join computation, right? So if we have the tables available in database and we don't need to fetch the tuples of our network. And that's the focus of the rest of this tutorial. And it's again motivated by this question is, how can we most effectively push sorting through joins if we actually uh, care about the, the operations of economy memory? I just flashed a quick slide. I want to mention again, there's a lot of follow-up work, all that uses this particular model of uh, using the number of access as the cost model. Okay, with this, I hand over to Mirek and the second part of our tutorial.